it's a pleasure to be here, Michael and, and, and Jacqueline for, you know, it's a pleasure to uh, be part of uh, this project that you guys are doing so with a lot of energy. So thank you for having, uh, you know, for having this video and everything. Wow. Um, so my name is Draulio um, Ara Araujo, that's how you say in Portuguese. I'm from Brazil. I work as a professor of neuroscience at the Brain Institute in the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte in Natal in Brazil. Um, and I've been uh, doing research with ayahuasca for um, the past 12 years um, when we started a pilot project uh, in Sao Paulo in Brazil in which we were interested in um, evaluating some of the neural bases of the ayahuasca effects using neuroimaging tools like functional magnetic resonance imaging. For that first set of studies, uh, for these first set of fMRI studies, um, we had the chance to get to know um, some people from uh, the Santo Daimi Church. So uh, all the participants from the first study that we conducted in Brazil, the fMRI study, all the participants came from one of the Santo Daimi Church. Um, because we wanted um, to have participants with a lot of experience in, in drinking ayahuasca. So most of our participants had at least 10 years of experience using ayahuasca in the church, and they volunteered then to participate in this study in which they would go to a hospital, um, they would do a first MRI scan without ayahuasca as a baseline, um, they, uh, we would take them out of the scanner, give them their, usually, uh, their usual amount of ayahuasca that they take in the church, so they would choose how much they wanted to take. Uh, they would drink the ayahuasca. We would wait for 40 minutes, and then we would have them inside the scanner again to do the second, uh, the second acquisition, the second scan while they were under the influence of ayahuasca. The basic idea of this project, this first study that we did, was to try to assess um, the neural basis of some of the ayahuasca effects, such as the vision. So we were interested in understanding the neural basis of, of, of the process that gives rise to the visions, to the mirações. That's the word that um, people in Brazil use for the visions. Um, and also to understand um, changes in introspection. So understand changes that happens, it's very significant during the acute effects of ayahuasca, which is an increased ability to be aware to your own thoughts and your own emotions. Um, so these were the two main questions that we had in our first study with ayahuasca back in 2006. But like I told you, to, uh, in order to conduct this study, uh, we needed participants with experience uh, in ayahuasca use, um, particularly for this project that we would, we would be having people inside an MRI scanner. And for those of you who have ever taken an MRI scanner know how claustrophobic that environment is, how noisy it is. So it's definitely not a comfortable um, environment, a comfortable setting to have an ayahuasca experience. Um, so we really needed um, experienced people to do the exam, to take part of that study. So we recruited um, individuals then from the church and in order to recruit we had a very um, good partnership with the church uh, designing the experiment because we wanted to have people feeling as comfortable as possible. So what kind of procedure should we take to make um, the, uh, the study a little bit more comfortable? For instance, having them deciding the amount of ayahuasca that they were going to take. So we were not, especially for experienced people, we were not the ones telling them uh, how much they should take. Um, so we had people taking from um, small amounts to larger amounts, depending on how um, they use ayahuasca on their regular basis in the church. Um, but when we started 
uh, building or, or, or uh, designing this project with the Santo Daime Church in Brazil. Uh, and by going to the church um, to have uh, conversations with people in the church and to try to recruit participants, it became clear um, that ayahuasca had some kind of therapeutic uh, uh, benefit just because a lot of the participants or a lot of the people in the church would just come naturally to us to tell their personal story with ayahuasca. Um, so uh, we could tell that they were really interested in sharing uh, what they found to be amazing and their personal experience with ayahuasca. And then we became really impressed by the fact that a lot of people in the church would just report feeling better from many conditions. Um, conditions should, such as anxiety, depression, um, substance misuse, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so they would naturally come and say, well, I, I got better uh, from, my, uh, uh, from my depression since I started taking ayahuasca. And uh, ayahuasca have been helping me out of the circle of depression. So I've been feeling better for the past five years, for the past two years. Um, um, so people would, would just share their experience. And because of that, um, it, we, we begun the perspective of trying to um, design a clinical trial in which we would test some therapeutic property of ayahuasca outside of the church. Mm -hmm. And why is it important to have these trials outside of the church? Because we know that religion itself um, have a very important therapeutic value for a lot of people. So a lot of people with these conditions, with substance misuse, with depression, with anxiety, they do find a lot of relief just by going to different churches. So it could be that um, people were reporting their uh, benefit, their therapeutic uh, effect of ayahuasca. It could be that that was a, an effect observed just because they are in a supportive environment um, with all the, 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 the language behind religion, which is also supportive. Um, so we thought it would be important to move the experience from a church to a very dry environment, which is a hospital. So back in 2008, we started with this perspective of, 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 of um, uh, uh, evaluating the antidepressant effects of ayahuasca. Uh, and then we started doing what we call a first, a open label trial. So an open label trial is a trial in which you recruit uh, patients. And in this case, we decided to focus on depression. So we would recruit patients with uh, treatment resistant depression. And um, treatment resistant depression are patients with depression that are not responding to currently available treatments for depression. Um, the formal definition, so there is a formal definition, um, a scientific definition of treatment resistant depression, which is um, patients who have tried at least two different medications at uh, the optimized dose uh, and these two medications have to come from different classes. Just like, uh, just like headache medications, uh, that you have different classes uh, of medication, you also have antidepressants from different uh, classes. So basically, um, treatment-resistant depression patients were the ones who had tried at least two of these and uh, that did not show any response, any benefit from the treatment. So the first study, um, the aim of the first study was uh, to bring some patients to the hospital, have a single session with ayahuasca in these patients, so they would experience 
one single session with ayahuasca in the hospital and they would and we would evaluate their symptoms of depression by using clinical scales um, that are used to assess the severity of depressive symptoms and these scales are basically applied by psychiatrists so we had then patients come into the hospital uh, we would evaluate them before the session with ayahuasca and then we would do follow-up evaluations on these patients already from 40 minutes after they uh, they drunk ayahuasca all the way to 21 days after the ayahuasca ingestion. Um, the first study was conducted with seven patients. Then we increased the number of patients to 17 patients. I think I should present, um, let me just share some of, of this with you. So this is the first paper that we published. Um, from the study with six patients. So basically what you see on the right is a graph in which the mean scores that you see refer to the mean scores on some scales that evaluate the severity of depression. So what you see as HEMD in the bottom and MADRS these are two scales that measure uh, the symptoms of depression. Uh, on the X axis, what you see is time. So you already see from minus 10, that's 10 minutes before they ingest ayahuasca, all the way to 180 minutes within the session. And then D1, D7, D14, and D21 are the evaluations that we made one day, two, seven days, 14 days, and 21 days after the session. What we see here then in this graph is that uh, there is a significant effect, a significant antidepressant effect of ayahuasca already one day after the session. Um, so one day after the session, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one day after the sessions, uh, the patients uh, would uh, show already a significant reduced um, symptoms of depression. And that lasted for 21 days. So you do see that the decrease they experienced uh, in the first day is present from day one to day 21. So this is the first trial. And that's when we decided to increase the number of patients to 17 patients just to see how consistent the results are. Uh, and we also added a um, SPECT evaluation, which is a neuroimaging evaluation, eight hours after the session. So in the second trial, we still had an open label trial in which patients are taking ayahuasca and they know that they're taking ayahuasca. We are not controlling for the placebo. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we did have a single session then for the 17 patients and eight hours after the session, we had them going through in a neuroimaging evaluation to, to uh, look for eventual differences in blood flow in different brain areas of these patients after they have uh, had the experience. Um, so these are the results from the second trial from the 17 patients um, with uh, the SPECT evaluation on the right. So are, one of- are, uh, you showing, does, are you showing the results from this? Because it still looks like the results from the first one, 12. Oh, it didn't change? Let's see. It didn't move? I'm, I'm showing 215, 37, 13-20. Uh, so this is not what you're seeing, right? No. Okay. No. Okay. Why, don't you, why don't you bring it back up? Okay. Um, yeah. Apparently, when I when I move it to full screen, it it loses. Oh, that's uh, okay. That's okay. Okay. Uh, I, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna try then to have it. Yes. Like this. That's good. Um, Excellent. Yes. And then we won't. There. There you go. Excellent. That's right? perfect. Perfect. So 
what you see here on the left um, are the results then from the second trial from the 17 patients and on the right are the neuroimaging evaluation that we ran eight hours after the session. Um, so consistent with the first trial, uh, what you see on the left, on these graphs on the left, so what you see in blue and in uh, red are the, uh, the effects of ayahuasca on depression on the same scales for depression that we saw in the last slide. So those are the results for the Hamilton scale and the Madras scale. Uh, what we see, so let's focus on that one first. What we see is um, a significant reduced um, symptoms of depression in both scales already 40 minutes into the trial. Uh, and this and and the the the, the reduced uh, if the reduced uh, depressive symptoms they keep on going from day one uh, day seven day fourteen and day twenty one so in other words for this second experiment what we observed was very similar to what we observed in the first one which was a significant decrease in the uh, uh, the depressive symptoms already in the session and one day, two day, one day, seven days, 14 days, and 21 days after the session. What we see in purple is the results for the CADSS. Uh, and you do see a significant increase on the purple line uh, in the session. So you see the 80 minutes into the session, there is a huge increase from the CADSS scale. And this is just telling us that they felt a significant psychedelic effect within the session. Uh, what you see in green is, um, are the results from another scale called YMRS, or Young Mania Rating Scale. And what this scale measures are symptoms of mania. And the reason why we were interested in measuring that is uh, because um, a lot of the, the psychedelic researchers uh, usually, or I'd say maybe all of the psychedelic research so far have um, paid a lot of attention and ha have been careful in including patients with um, bipolar disorders or patients with um, schizophrenia or family history of schizophrenia. Um, so this is what science have been doing for now and we were interested then in evaluating what is the impact on many a form symptoms during and after the acute effects of ayahuasca in, in patients that have unipolar depression. And what we see in green is that there is no significant increase in many a form events on these patients. That naturally doesn't mean that there is no increase in many a form events in patients with bipolar disorder. It might be that there is. Um, just so what we are showing here are the results for unipolar uh, depression. Uh, what you see on the right then are the results from the SPECT evaluation that we had uh, eight hours after the session. And what you see here are in increased blood flow in different areas of the brain um, that all of them have been related to mood disorders. Um, these areas um, that we show here are the insula, the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex, uh, and the, um, oh Jesus, the nuclear cumbens. I'm sorry. Um, so these three regions have been uh, consistently implicated in mood disorders. And what we see here is that after a session with ayahuasca, uh, the activity of these regions have changed. Um, so it might be that this is one of the ways 
that these patients are feeling better by having these regions modulated by ayahuasca. Um, so the, the, the main problem with this study is that we don't have, uh, we, we, we do not control for the placebo. Um, so it means that, oh, I can't go to the next slide. How do I move to the next slide? <laughs> uh, well, okay. All right. Um, so one of, one of the issues with uh, this study is that we are not controlling for the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is very important in depression. You can have a placebo effect up to 40%. In other words, uh, you can have patients coming to a clinical trial um, uh, uh, in depression that it's gonna test a new antidepressant. Uh, and about 40% of, of these patients that go through a placebo treatment, they get better they get significantly better. Uh, and this is even more the case when you are studying patients with treatment-resistant depression, just because um, we have to realize that a lot of these patients have been trying to find a treatment for depression for the past 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, um, that they have been on that search. And all of a sudden, they, found them, they find themselves among these group of professionals from different specialities in the best hospital in the neighborhood trying to develop this scientific project around a new treatment for depression. So all of that brings a lot of hope to these patients to, the, to a point that a lot of these patients would just come up um, freely to me and would say, uh, you know, doctor, I think I'm going to get better this time. I can't feel it because, you know, I, I, I know that, um, you, you know, you guys are really good in what you do. I know that this hospital is, is number one in the city. Um, I've heard of that guy as someone that knows what he's doing. So all of that puts a lot more hope in the basket, which means that afterwards, uh, a placebo effect, you, you would expect to have a significant increased placebo effect. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you all of this just to, um, so that you have an idea of how important it is to have a placebo controlled in these studies, because it could be that everything that we saw in our first two studies were um, nature of the placebo effect. Um, so it, 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 the, the, the results we found was just because the placebo effect was there. Um, so because of that, we took the other step, which was to uh, uh, do a randomized trial in which half of the patients uh, would drink ayahuasca and half of the patients would drink a placebo substance. Uh, this is how uh, the trial uh, went on. Um, so we, we, we interviewed or um, we had clinical evaluations of 218 patients uh, with depression. Uh, most of them fell into some kind of exclusion criteria. Uh, either bipolar disorder. Most of them, um, they, uh, the reason why they were not included is because they were not under treatment. So in other words, they, they, they had um, a significant depression, but they were not being treated at the moment of the trial. So that is one of the reasons why they were not included in the trial. So it turned out that we randomized 35 patients um, half of them had a session with ayahuasca and half of them had a session with the placebo. Uh, a big challenge in these studies <clears throat> is to have what we call a double blind study. Uh, and this is the case for any study with a psychedelic substance. So whenever you wanna do a randomized trial, 
with a uh, psychedelic substance, <clears throat> uh, it's really hard to preserve study blindness because all of these studies, they have the premise that uh, neither the researcher nor the patient knows what kind of treatment is that individual being submitted to. So we don't know if that session, we should not know if that session is done with ayahuasca or with placebo. So because of that, uh, and, and that becomes a problem when talking about a psychedelic substance. So how is it that you're going to have someone going through a psychedelic experience and try to tell them that that was actually a placebo experience? That's really hard. Um, so actually there's no way you're going to do it. There's no way you're going to have people, um, uh, mistaking ayahuasca for placebo. Um, so the strategy then that we have is to boost the placebo effect. So although you cannot have people in the ayahuasca group thinking that what they had is the placebo, we could have people in the placebo group thinking that what they had is an ayahuasca experience. Uh, so how did we go about to do that? So we took a number of measures uh, or uh, to try to uh, increase the placebo effect. And these measures were basically the following. First of all, all of our patients were uh, ayahuasca naive. So they had no idea what they were expecting. Second, in our instructions, we would make sure that um, they got the following message. Uh, you could have an ayahuasca, an experience with ayahuasca and feel very little. Or you could have an experience with placebo and feel something. So what did we do in order to have them feeling something during the placebo experience? Basically, we had, we designed the placebo that carried part of the symptoms that are frequently observed in an ayahuasca experience. But we did not want to play with um, um, neurophysiological uh, uh, changes. So we did not want to have uh, things that might uh, uh, confound the results that we have later on. So basically what we had is a placebo substance that um, gives nausea, some patients um, vomited, and one patient had diarrhea. So we designed a placebo substance that's basically, um, it had a, a, a color kind of brown, an earth kind of color. Um, it was bitter. So um, it was sour. Uh, and so basically to do that, what we had was water, yeast, caramel, caramel corant, colorant, um, zinc sulfur that's bitter and produces all the nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, and citric acid to have a sour taste. Uh, and actually, uh, about 40% of the patients in our group that took ayahuasca, that took the placebo, thought that they have taken ayahuasca. Uh, no one in the ayahuasca group thought that they had taken the placebo though, um, just as expected. Um, the other thing that I want to mention, and especially for the people that have done the therapeutic workshop, uh, is uh, the discussion around set and setting, which we know it's very important for, uh, for the psychedelic experience. Uh, so let's just first 
um, talk about set. Uh, so set is basically the set of the individual, right? Um, features of the individual, characteristics of the individual. Uh, and these individuals, at least part of these individuals, they are in a very particular set, which is they have depression. So that places them already in a very particular set. Uh, but this is something uh, we, we actually, that we didn't want to control. So this is something that comes with, uh, with whatever they come with. Uh, and what about the setting? So this is the setting that we had. So you see that's a pretty dry environment. It's in a hospital, but we try to make it looking like uh, a living room, not like a hospital. So you see the bed is not a hospital bed. It's got a recliner. It's got a couple of frame um, uh, 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 paintings. Um, so we try to have it as uh, comfortable as possible. Um, and in fact, what happened was that most of our patients, they come from very difficult social economic realities in Brazil. Um, so a lot of them didn't have jobs. A lot of them were living in, in, in very difficult conditions. So it turns out that when they came to the hospital to do the experiment, this set was like a five-star hotel. Actually, this was an amazing set for our patients to a point that some of our patients would ask to stay over for the weekend. Um, you know, they, would, they, would, they don't want to go home because the conditions that they have at home is much worse than the conditions that they found in the hospital. Uh, the second uh, 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 argument or, uh, that I have, uh, uh, the second point that I want to make is that uh, having a first experience in the hospital turned out to be positive. Because uh, when we first considered it, and I'm sure that you're, a lot of people that are listening to me are considering it as well, is how, how do you take a substance out of its traditional use? bring it to a hospital and hope to have people um, transcend or hope to have people have mystical experiences or hope to have people transforming themselves in such a dry environment and meaningless environment. Um, but it turns out that one of the most important aspects to have a profound psychedelic experience is to feel safe. You have to feel safe in order to be able to trust. If you don't feel safe, you're not gonna trust. If you don't trust, the experience is gonna be very different. Maybe with more suffering. Uh, so to our positive surprise, what happened is that um, all of our subjects, all of the participants, which were 85, because besides the 35 patients with depression, we also had 50 individuals, healthy individuals, uh, going through the same process that the patients were going through. Uh, and also these 50 control individuals had no experience with psychedelics. This was their first experience with a psychedelic substance, just as the patients. So it turned out that this was a, a, a pretty safe setting. And the setting uh, that they would be able to trust. You know, I mean, if, if you consider of having a a, a really bad experience with a psychedelic substance, I'm sure that if the worst becomes to worse, 
whoever is with you is going to probably take you to a hospital or at least for people that don't have the trust in other traditions uh would you know if if i'm having my first uh, experience with psychedelic and i think that i'm about to die um thinking that i'm in the hospital gives me a little bit of comfort because anyways that was going to be the place that i was going to go uh, or that a lot of people would go if they felt in that situation if they felt themselves in that situation so it turned out that the setting the hospital setting wasn't as bad as we thought at first actually it was good uh, <clears throat> so these are the results from then the second trial <clears throat> these are the results that um, uh, from this trial and what you see now again what you see are the results from one of the scales the Madras scale that assess um, the the severity of the depressive symptoms and what you see here is a what you see in red is the ayahuasca group and what you see in blue is the placebo group um, so first of all you do see a significant reduced um, uh, depressive symptoms in both groups um, in both the ayahuasca group, you have a significant increase, uh, decrease in, in the depressive symptoms one day after the session, and that maintains pretty much constant from day one to day seven. Uh, when we look at the, the placebo group, we do see a significant decrease in the placebo group one day after the session. It, it's kept decreased um, two days after the session, but it goes back uh, seven days after the session. <clears throat> you can see this more clear in this graph here, which relates to the response and remission rate. So how, how much, um, uh, 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 what is the response rate? What is the percentage response rate in both groups? Uh, one day, two days, and seven days after the session. So what we see here is that uh, approximately 50% of the patients responded. So the graph on the left, what you see here is about 50% of the patients responded one day after the session in both groups that number increased to approximately 60% two days after the session. And seven days after the session, what you see is that the response on the placebo group is 64%, while the response on the placebo group is about 27%. So what we see here is that there is indeed a significant placebo effect we observed a significant placebo effect in both groups. Uh, I mean, in the, in the placebo group, we did observe a significant placebo effect. But that effect vanishes seven days after the session, while the effect of ayahuasca is still there seven days after the session. Uh, one thing I want to comment is that uh, we tend to put the placebo effect as something very negative. So even in my speech, I mean, I've, I've, I've been telling you that I have to control for the placebo effect, that uh, the results that we got from the open label trial might be just the placebo effect. So even in my speech, I use the placebo effect as something bad. But once you see the placebo effect, you'll see that this is one of the most beautiful things that you can see. Uh, to me as a scientist, that was definitely uh, the most beautiful effect that I've ever seen. Um, you know, you see someone with 30 years with depression that have taken 15 different medications for depression and that all of a sudden he comes to a hospital, he does a placebo session and he gets out of the hospital cured. This is the type of example that I've seen. Um, so it's not bad. 
<laughs> it's just beautiful. And I'm sure that the placebo effect is present in the ayahuasca effect. Is there? Of course. What is the placebo effect? So I'll, um, you know, just a little bit of discretion. Uh, uh, I, we do have to think, you know, if we, if we, if we think deep enough of what the placebo effect is, we are going to realize that actually we are placebo machines. Um, so what makes you get out of the bed in the morning, brush your teeth and do something, whatever that is, what makes you do that? Basically is you do that because you believe in what you do somehow. Um, you, you do believe that you do believe that you have, I mean, so believe is in the, bottom line of the placebo effect is is the essence of the placebo effect is believing so actually um you know when we think of the placebo effect we have to consider it as something very profound in the nature of the human being of you know doing things because we believe in things so one thing i want to comment is is that the placebo effect we observed was very significant. Um, and why is it that the placebo effect was so uh, much higher, I'd say, in our sample as compared to uh, the placebo effect in, 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 um, in other studies? Um, so here I point to two reasons, um, three reasons. First is that the patients come from very low socioeconomic status. Um, so when coming to a hospital, a very comfortable environment, um, uh, they just get rid of their own environment, which is a hard one. And that's the reason why a lot of the patients would just ask to stay in a hospital for a couple more days. The second is what we call a care effect, which is... Um, the group that was working with these patients is a really amazing group of people, of humans, of people that really care about the other people, about, about the other person, the people that are there taking, you know, paying a lot of attention to whatever story they want to tell, uh, being very supportive to whatever they need, eating good food staying in a room that had air conditioner, that had no noise, that had no uh, gunshots, that I don't have to worry with my son being involved with uh, drug dealers. Like we had patients that, um, we had one patient for instance that uh, uh, this lady, she had lost one son to, um, to, to drug dealers and she was having a second son um, in the same path. So what kind, of, what kind of environment does she find when she goes back home? I mean, how do you control depression with such a hard environment? So this is one of the reasons why the placebo effect that we had was really high. And this, the third uh, reason why we had such a high placebo effect is that in our trial, contrary to every trial out there so far, we did not exclude patients with uh, personality disorder. In fact, 76% of our patients had personality disorder. And it's important to mention that this is an exclusion criteria for every trial that's out there. Um, so this, and, and what it's been observed in a lot of these patients is that personality disorder comes with a significant increased placebo effect. So this is another reason why we might have observed such a high placebo effect. Uh, how does that compare to other treatments that are um, showing up as alternative for depression? So I wanna focus on one of them, which was um, coincidentally, 
approved yesterday by the FDA as a new treatment for depression, which is ketamine. So ketamine was approved yesterday, just um, coincidentally, it was approved yesterday. So uh, uh, this is how our study compared to the, the results in ketamine. What you see in the bottom left is a trial, exactly like our trial, testing ketamine for treatment-resistant depression. Um, this, is, this is what you see for ketamine. So you see basically here that um, the most significant effect of ketamine happens one day after the session. You do see that this is where there is the biggest difference between the two groups. So if you look at the white and the black circles, you do see that day one is when we have the, the largest separation between groups. And that's what it means that the, the, the effect is most significant. But when we go back towards day seven, you do see that the effects diminishes. For ayahuasca, that's not the case. Actually, for ayahuasca, the effects seem to increase towards D7, not decrease towards D7. When we compare ketamine with uh, ayahuasca using a parameter that's called um, effect size, which is a parameter that the FDA uses to evaluate how efficient a, a specific substance is, what we see is that the effect size of ayahuasca at day one is compared to the effect size of ketamine of that day one. Ketamine having an effect size of 0 0.89 and ayahuasca having an effect size of 0 0.84. Day two, they still comparable. Ketamine has an effect size of 0.81 and ayahuasca has an effect size of 0.84. But when it goes to day seven, then the picture changes completely. Um, while we have a decreased effect size for ketamine and it goes down to 0 0.41, for ayahuasca, it increases significantly and it reaches the highest effect size that we observed to 1.49. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is um, that we evaluated the effects in these patients during the acute effects of ayahuasca, uh, looking for uh, mystical experiences or, or using scales that are out there to access um, the psychedelic, the effects of psychedelics. And what we see here is that um, consistent with other studies, um, there is a significant uh, increase in, in mystical experience. Um, so what you see in red is, uh, are the mystical experiences for the group, the ayahuasca group, and what you see in blue are the mystical experiences for the placebo group. So it's very clear that there is a, a significant difference between the mystical experience in both groups using both the mystical experience questionnaire as well as uh, the hallucinogenic rating scale, which is the one that's on the left. Um, so I guess that this is um, mainly, uh, you know, the, the the type of study that we have been interested in doing, the type of study that we have done already. So um, our, yeah, uh, our history in, in, in the uh, science with ayahuasca. <clears throat> um, the, the study has a number of limitations, like a list here. So we only have 35 patients. Uh, the study was limited to a very specific group of patients. We only have asked assessed uh, the effects for seven days so there's no um, studying uh, we, we haven't studied the, the long-term effects of, of the treatment um, but still I mean it's something that it, 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 it gives support to the idea that um, when 
using psychedelics with the appropriate uh, set, setting, and intention, um, we, we might get very positive benefits in, um, in treating uh, mood disorders that don't have the adequate treatment for now. Um, to conclude, I just want to, um, you know, tell you guys that this is a, 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 a study. I'm here representing a number of people. Uh, it's a large study. Um, uh, this study, the, the, the randomized trial, um, it was a study in which we evaluated 85 people, 85 individuals for four days. So it was a three-year study um, with a lot of people involved, like uh, the ones that I'm listing here. And this is like the, the, the hardcore group uh, of people that were uh, together uh, dealing with the patients um, and, and, and trying to you know, treat them as well as as and and in a supportive environment as possible, um, so I'm <clears throat> I'm sure that uh, a great part of the placebo effect that we observed come from these people. So yeah, um, I guess uh, uh, this is it. Thank you, Michael. Thank that you. is oh. that is such an amazing amazing piece of research. So a question I have is. Anybody else doing these kinds of double-blind studies on ayahuasca to the degree that you have done? Not that I'm aware of. Um, okay, so this is yeah. groundbreaking research then. Yeah, yeah. I, this is the, actually, Michael, this is the first study. This is the first randomized study to try a psychedelic substance in treatment-resistant depression. Of any the other psychedelic? Study, any psychedelic, yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the other studies that are out there um, are, um, there's one study from uh, the English group, a group in English that's led by Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt. They have conducted a study with psilocybin mm -hmm. in treatment-resistant depression 12 patients, but that was an open label trial. Mm. So that compares to our study with 18 patients, with 17 mm. patients that we had the SPECT evaluation. Now, I have, go ahead. That's where the, uh, the open label trial with psilocybin for treatment resistance um, uh, uh, depression uh, compares to our trial with treatment resistant depression. So it's an open label trial. Meaning, they haven't it's done not a double randomized blind. part of it. Yeah, it's they not double blind. No. It's not, the, they, there's no placebo. Right. Okay. All right. There is another piece of, but there are, um, there is another study or another group of studies that have done randomized trials with psilocybin. But these randomized trials were done in patients uh, that are suffering um, terminal ill patients. Mm -hmm. And basically what they're doing is to access uh, the symptoms of depression and anxiety in these patients and seeing how uh, a single session with psilocybin changes those symptoms. Jack and I is, saw those videos. Uh, the New York Times published videos of, of um, most of them terminally ill cancer patients who had, prior to the, uh, to the clinical study, uh, they were suffering, most if not all of them were suffering major existential anxiety. Right? Exactly, yeah. right. So they're, basically, they're so, the, the, the group, the depression in the, um, so the depression in, the, in, in this group of patients is not the primary condition. No, it's the anxiety. Right. Yeah. 
but I can if, relate to I that. Mean, the primary condition, what I'm trying to say is that the primary condition is their terminal illness. Yes. That is the primary condition, which comes with depression and anxiety. Right. And I can relate to that. I, am, I have two ongoing cancers, as you know. And, yeah. And uh, my family does not have a good track record in terms of survivability. And, uh, and it wasn't until actually my first ayahuasca session that um, I uh, essentially lost that anxiety. And I'm very at peace with it, and mm -hmm. as Jacqueline is. And, uh, and interestingly, it has allowed us to live our lives so much more fully. Sure, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when, you, when you embrace your inevitable immortality, <laughs> you, you actually give yourself permission to live fully. Yeah. And at least that's what we have found. I guess the, the, the main message, my, at least to me, um, not during the acute effects necessarily, but um, the subacute effects one day after is the value that we put into life. Yes. Right? Yes. So yes. It, 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 it's really curious, the fact that um, you have a substance that allows you to face um, part of your essence, which, which goes past um, the cycle of life and death. Yes. Uh, and basically what it brings back to you is the value that life has in the circle, right? Yes, um, absolutely. So, yeah. So, it, so it I, is a paradox uh, because, uh, you know, most people fear death uh, intensely. <laughs> and, uh, but in the process of fearing death, if they are able to embrace that inevitability with the help, perhaps, of these substances <laughs> and the experiences that they have, assuming it's a clinical setting with uh, good integration, um, they free themselves up now to live like fully without that anxiety and uh, surrender to the in inevitable, but not give up on living life, quite the opposite. Yeah, exactly. Yes. That's my feeling as well. Yeah. Yes. So just, um, just then to put that in perspective, this is how our study compares to the other studies that are out there. So in other words, there's, this is the first study to test in a psychedelic substance in treatment-resistant depression. Yeah. 